and I start recording again. Put some gel. Um, okay, so you can you can uh, simply have, have this uh, also as a kind of a pr primer or, or some sort of a table to to remember uh, those large scale processes. But remember, it's not complete. I haven't had time to finish, and there is also uh, tectonic signals on much smaller time scales. This is the tectonic signal of the of the entire setting. Okay, of the entire orogen basin system. In a divergent setting, so when there is, for instance, divergence, you have two plates. Uh, so, so there is one plate at the beginning, it breaks because of far field forces or uh, mantle upwelling. But it, the plate breaks and as soon as it breaks, you now have two plates and the plate boundary. From there on, the plates go apart of each other. And this results in, this is expressed or this is made by uh, brittle deformation in the, in, the, in the crust. And other type of deformation down there, uh, in the more ductile parts of the lithosphere. Um, and so at the beginning, you really have fast tectonic subsidence. This is the McKenzie, Dan McKenzie uh, model that you've probably seen with Guy Simpson in the MATLAB lecture, I think. And this results in this very fast subsidence here, rifting and tectonic subsidence at the beginning. And that's on a time scale of maybe 20 million years, maybe 10, maybe 15. And this is just the blocks uh, sliding on top of each other and the lithosphere being thinned very rapidly. And so you deposit sediment in this basin and also because of this tectonic unloading, you see that here on a vertical section here, on a vertical profile here, you take some of the crust that was here, you take it out. The lithosphere is thinner. When the lithosphere is thinner, uh, upstream of uh, above here, you will have a rebound. Okay, the whole thinned lithosphere goes down, but those places here, uh, that are unloaded, they, uh, they rebound isostatically. And so that generates a little bit of rift shoulder uplift, which is also a result, um, to my understanding, of heating. Because, there is, because you thin the lithosphere, the mantle is closer to the surface. And if this is uh, faster than the time scale for Heat to re-equilibrate within uh, this zone, then uh, the area becomes uh, warmer, if you want. And that's why there is so much uh, volcanism and such a high geothermal gradient and such a high heat flux uh, in rifting zones, okay? The result is also some sort of thermal doming, a little bit like a souffle, you know, like a, a warm cake which is a little bit inflated, and then it deflates uh, as it cools down. Um, but this is minor, okay, compared to the whole rock uplift and erosion that takes place in a, in a mountain range. This generates little flux, okay, little tectonic, uh, little uh, erosional flux. Still, it's there, and, and along the margins of, uh, of uh, riftings, uh, you still have some local, uh, quite local fluxes, sediment flux. So this is what I represented here. There is a little bit of uh, shoulder uplift, erosion, and a resulting uh, topography. But then it declines with time. So if you look at the topography of passive margins, and passive margins are uh, where initially active rifting. So initially they had a, a shoulder like this. Uh, presumably, 
originally there was some topography, but when you look at passive margins today, like the east coast of America or the west coast of France, uh, there is no topography or very little. Okay, so there is also another effect is that when you two plates are sufficiently apart of each other, what you, you thin the lithosphere so much, the, the, the continental lithosphere so much, then it actually uh, it's finished and it becomes oceanic lithosphere. The mantle could reach the surface in places, but also it, there is melting uh, and you create uh, basalts and the whole uh, oceanic lithosphere uh, succession. And from there on, you have a mid ocean ridge uh, system. And the two plates, they drift apart of each other in opposite directions. And they become passive. In a way, there is no more tectonics on them. OK? Uh, there can be, sorry, local tectonics. Like I told you yesterday on this basin, I said there is intra-basin tectonics. like salt and etc there is gravity tectonics but there is no uh, tectonics due to divergence the margin is passive it just drifts rafts apart they they apart of each other they they raft apart of each other what happens though is that now the margin can cool and to cool uh, so so this cooling process results in in subsidence uh, your whole lithosphere re-becomes uh, denser, if you want, and a little bit like the image of the cake, uh, it deflates slowly. And as it deflates and it becomes colder and colder, it deflates slower and slower. So subsidence, what is called thermal subsidence here, is very small and is smaller and smaller with time, such that it, it reaches very small level uh, and it's very small, but it lasts very long. Okay. So yes. the time scale of uh, so the, this gives you a little bit the time scale of rifting, maybe twenty million years active rifting, and then you're no more in the rifting concept context. You are in a thermal subsidence passive margin context, and this can last very long. As you can see, uh, many margins of modern oceans started in the Jurassic or in the Cretaceous, so at least 100 million years ago. Okay, so passive margin basins are very long life. Um, okay, now I want to speak about a last type of um, tectonic signal is tectonic signal due to dynamic topography. And I don't know if you've heard the term before, dynamic topography. Uh, you no. If you... No. 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 No? Maybe. Maybe. Um, so, um, the, how to introduce this? Just very sim simply, in a simplified way, uh, what I try to represent here is the lithosphere in gray, and it's a block uh, through the lithosphere where we see the mantle below uh, and the surface. Okay. And you know, the mantle uh, has convection, convective motions into it. If you think, you know Hawaii, the hotspot of Hawaii? Below Hawaii, there is a mantle plume. And it looks like the oceanic lithosphere has been moving above this plume. OK? And so it's a little bit like if you have, a, you know, one of those, uh, I don't know what's the term in English, the chalumeau. So this gas fire that you use to melt metal. Okay, uh, it's a pistol that sends a lot of fire and, and it's very uh, hot. So if you, if you put your pistol below a, a moving metal plate, you are going to generate 
uh, at the surface, you will see the trace of that at the surface. Okay. And it looks like uh, we can consider the plume of how I like fixed with respect to the North Pole and the South Pole. Uh, so it's fixed with respect to the globe, whereas the plate moves relative to the to the plume. That's why the, the, the Hawaii uh, Islands makes an archipelago, an archipelago. It's a little bit the same sometimes, but without melting necessarily. The, this, this convective motion, they are uh, slow, but they have sufficiently uh, long term long life that they can be considered fixed and the lithosphere moves above it <coughs> sometimes it moves because of it but the, there is a result of this convective motion and here you have a, a mountain going up it looks a bit like a mushroom here okay it goes up and it should be going down here and going down here I should have put more arrows. And here it goes down. Of course, this is a bad representation because it, it doesn't have a source. The source of mantle going down is not here. It should be like a motion like this and a, a, an arrow like this, okay? But here it goes down, it goes up. And that, as it goes up, it kind of pushes a little bit the lithosphere upwards. And you have some elevation of the topography. And here it pulls the lithosphere down and you have a depression of the topography. If you think about it, it's like when you, when you cook milk or when you boil water, if you do it slowly, uh, you see some topography at the top of the water, at the surface of the water. In some places it's going up because of, or like in the jacuzzi, in some places it's going up in some places it's going down a little bit. Okay, and so what's important here is the, the, the spatial scales we are speaking about. And again, the figure is not finished, but these are large scale. You can imagine the, the, the mantle as convection motion, but it's not liquid. Okay, so it does that on very large length scales. And here I put for indication 100, 300 kilometers. Maybe I'm wrong, maybe it could be smaller, but I think it's more commonly on those type of length uh, scales. And the time scale is also long. Okay, it's gonna be several tens of million years, again, because the mantle doesn't uh, stop and go. So, ah, and the height, the vertical scale, is, uh, I haven't read enough on this, but I saw a, a, a presentation by Peter Molna uh, once in, in Italy. And he was saying, basically, we are uh, limited to hundreds, 300 meters uh, type of elevation, depression. Maybe it could be a kilometer, let's say, uh, but it's, it's not much compared to, uh, to the others, okay? So the resulting is that in a fixed reference frame, let's say you are at this crossing on the grid where my, my mouse is at this point, you know, as the plate moves, it's gonna go up and then it's gonna go down. And if it moves into a depression, you will have up and down. Okay. And the topography is going to go up, but not as up as it's uplifted because there is erosion and not as down as it's subsiding because there is sedimentation. So that's the way I see it. And uh, I'm not totally happy with this, but, um, but uh, that gives you at least some elements of thinking about large scale tectonic uh, signals. Remember, if you use tectonics alone, la tectonique, uh, you should put an S, okay? If you use uh, tectonic as a, so the name is with an S. If you use it as an adjective, tectonic signals, then it doesn't take an S. Okay, now climate. 
So that's also in the making. And I use, and I, it lacks uh, references, but we are running uh, late in the course. So it's, it's cramming towards less and less well done uh, slides. But this, this is a slide, uh, a figure that I will put in the Vademecum that we're doing on source to sync, uh, on the source to sync approach. And it's meant to represent climate on the Phanerozoic timescale. You remember the Phanerozoic? It's all this timescale here from 550 million years ago to now. It, it, it has the um, primary era, secondary uh, here, and the Triassic, Jurassic, Cretaceous, tertiary, and then the quaternary. Here, I zoom on the Cenozoic. So this is Paleozoic, Mesozoic, Cenozoic. Here, I zoom on the Cenozoic, part of the Mesozoic here. But the Cenozoic, the tertiary era starts here at 65 and not 66. I should check. Um, and here, I zoom on the last million year or 800,000 years. Um, what is climate? What's the definition of climate first? I mean, the, there is one official uh, definition, uh, if you look on Wikipedia, I think, or in, uh, in, in I don't know what kind of literature, but um, often climate is taken as the average of variables that define climate, such as temperature and precipitation. But it could be other variables. You could take snow cover, uh, etc. Others, I can't really think of. I don't know. There are other parameters in the, in, in, in the weather. But this, it's the average of, uh, let's say, temperature and, and precipitation over 30 years, 30 ans. So, and then depending on those averages, the geographers, I think, or the climatologists, they have a, a big classification called the Köppen classification. And you know, that's those arid, semi-arid, humid. It's all these drawers in which you can put your climate in. Okay, so if you have more than 500 millimeter per, of rain per year and the temperature of over temperature, you're going to be in a cold, semi-arid, or whatever climate. Um, because, of course, you cannot take the yearly, uh, you know, you cannot take the, the temperature and precipitation of the summer in your place to define the climate, because it's a seasonal variation. And you cannot take it also uh, one year only, because, uh, you know, it, it changes from one year to another. So the official definition is 30 years. That said, in geology, climate is a bit uh, less well defined, or I haven't found at least a geological definition of climate. So in a way, I think, because we clearly don't have the resolution uh, to look at 30 years uh, timescales uh, in the past, and climate is the general state of the planet in terms of global average temperature, uh, global ice cover, uh, global rainfall, uh, you know, so global humidity. Uh, that's the general state of the climate when we look at, uh, we, we can also look at, at how it changes with latitude, but it's, it's those general parameters on geological timescales. And so I start with the, I mean, my, my main message is going to be that climate changes at, at a very large range of timescales and with, with, uh, with quite a, a range of magnitude, of, of, of amplitudes. But it's quite striking to see this. Actually, it's, quite, it's a figure you can spend a lot of time uh, watching because you realize that uh, if this is true, then there were times 500 million years ago, where the global temperature was not very different as today. 
So the world would, would have been perhaps habitable by, by us uh, in terms of temperature, at least. I don't know in terms of gases or, or other, um, other creatures going around. Like, I don't know if you want, you would have wanted to, to live around T-Rex and his uh, cousins. But it looks like temperature, for instance, in this diagram, this is global average temperature, has been oscillating between 26, 27, and 12, 14 degrees globally. Okay. Today, the global temperature, temperature of the globe now is, I think, 14.5 or 14.9 degrees. You can check this. I, I really advise you the, the, the website of the um, uh, IPCC, Intergovernmental Pla Panel on Climate Change, or the GIEC, the Group Intergovernmental uh, sur le Changement Climatique. Um, they have an amazing uh, amount of resources on, on, on climate and the current climate. So this curve up there is, I, I have taken by um, Christopher Scottis, uh, who has a, a paper in the making, I think, uh, but I'd like to find the, the, the exact reference when it's out. Um, and I haven't searched enough to, to, to know how he derived this, but it's based on a, a large amount of data uh, Christopher Scottis has been compiling maps of the world, ge um, plate reconstructions, climatic reconstruction, vegetation reconstruction, relief uh, reconstructions, etc., etc. He's been compiling this in a, in, a, in a range of paleo maps. Maybe you've seen those maps, you know, map of the world in the Permian, map of the globe in the Cambrian, where you see these old continents, uh, you know, Pangea, etc. And so he has a lot of data to reconstruct global climate. And uh, so, but, but anyway, the curve is to be taken with caution. And anyway, in geology, there is a big uh, margin of uncertainty, much bigger than the grayish sort of uncertainty margin that is behind here. But it's maybe also very correct. Okay. Anyway, let's take it at face value and, and look at it uh, for what it is. It seems that climate, global temperature at least, has been evolving, oscillating between states of hot house, which is above 24 degrees, greenhouse, temperate, like uh, where we are kind of now, and ice house, which is glacial periods. Okay, there is a glacial period here, sometimes in the uh, end Ordovician. Also a big one here, end of the Carboniferous, beginning of the Permian. This is a specific event, uh, which has, I don't know much about, but it's the Cretaceous tertiary asteroid impact. And Remember, K is for uh, Kreide, Cretaceous in German. So KT is the KT boundary, the, 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 the boundary between the Mesozoic era and the tertiary era. And so this, this, uh, this impact uh, of an asteroid may have changed everything. And during a moment, there may have been some sort of impact winter which may have lasted more than just one winter, but it's a moment where the earth was really cold due to especially dust in the uh, higher, uh, higher levels of our atmosphere. Okay, the, the theory is very popular, was very popular uh, during the Cold War because there was a, bit, a lot of fear of a nuclear, of a nuclear uh, world war and, and the fear of a nuclear winter. Maybe you've heard the term nuclear winter. 
uh, this will be uh, what would happen if we had uh, many atomic bomb exploding worldwide. Uh, there would be so much dust uh, in the atmosphere that this could uh, generate a long-term state of darkness, uh, preventing vegetation to grow, uh, crops uh, and inducing famine and, and a lot of problems not so indirectly linked with the, with the atomic uh, bombs and and people think that so, somewhat maybe what happened after the asteroid uh, impacted Earth uh, at the KT boundary so that's why uh, maybe some species have, have died because they didn't have enough to eat etc etc and then there is the last glacial era, so Plyo Pleistocene period, where we have ice in the south and in the north. Uh, and this is the last glacial maximum. And recently we are going actually, uh, now we are somewhere here and going here. Okay, so we could make a zoom. I didn't put it here, I, and I don't, I also didn't put it here. We could make a zoom of uh, where we are, but the trend is taking us, you know, back here very fast. Okay. Um, what else? I mean, there is several hot houses. Um, so therefore, you see there are some large scale trends, I would say. Um, cooling, warming, cooling, warming long cooling trend here at the Triassic all the way down into the Jurassic not a, not an ice house here but a colder period and then warming in the Cretaceous all the way to a quite a warm state here and then cooling in the late Cretaceous cooling down to the KT winter and then a very strong rebound here with a warm period here in the in the early Cenozoic, and then the cooling since then, okay, uh, ending up in the, in the current uh, cooling ages. Um, so these are trends, tendencies, long term, and they have a, they clearly have an impact on sediment uh, distribution and sedimentary environments worldwide. What's the reason for these long-term trends, do you think? Uh, the, the Milankovitch cycle? <coughs> nope. No. Good try, Betim, but the Milankovitch cycles um, are supposed to be at higher frequencies than this. So, ah, okay. So here we are looking at a cooling trend, for instance, for the mid from the middle Devonian hothouse to the Permian, which is 100 million years. Mm -hmm. Here we go from Triassic to Jurassic, again, 100 million years. And here we go from PTM to now 65 million years. So these long trends seems to be more associated with plate tectonics and the configurations the configuration of continents on Earth and perhaps the hypsometry of continents, whether there is high, high elevated areas, very or very active ridges, mid-oceanic ridges, you know, making warm oceans with, with uh, inundated continental areas, uh, shallow seas being prone to remaining warm. So this seems to be the, the case. For instance, at least when I was a, a student, and I haven't read much about this recently, but here in the in these times of uh, of the Cretaceous, there seems to be not much relief on Earth, not much mountain ranges. Uh, I think the Andes are already there or in the process, but but uh, also the the Rockies probably, but but not too much. Himalayas aren't there, also. Maybe they are, but not too much, not as we know them. The Alps are not there. They just start maybe at some point. But, um, and especially you seem to have very active uh, mid-oceanic uh, spreading 
okay, the mid-oceanic ridges, the mid-oceanic volcanic centers, they are very active. When you have very active oceanic uh, spreading centers, your plate, uh, so your, your oceanic crust is, is uh, so there is a lot of mantle and, and basalt coming. These, these forces a lot of uh, oceanic crust creation in the mid-oceanic ridge, and therefore you have kind of a, a bulge, okay, in the mid-ocean, in the middle of the ocean. On the contrary, if you have a slow spreading center, uh, the ridge, the, the plate, the new oceanic plate go apart from each other very slowly, and therefore they have time to cool and to sink. So a mid, an active, a very fast oceanic, cent, oceanic uh, spreading center will, have, will be kind of bulgy and high. And so you will have a shallow ocean Whereas a slow oceanic uh, spreading center will have a spiky ridge and a deep ocean. The result is that you have to put all your oceanic water into, into uh, a shallow ocean or into a deep ocean. So all, if you have your, all your, the same amount of water in a shallow ocean, you, you force sea level to go up. That's what we see actually in the sea level curves that I, that, I see, that I show here, is that in general, there is some sort of correlation at least between uh, temperature and, um, and sea level. Okay. That's also because when sea level is rising and high, it goes up on all continental platforms. And so this creates first less continental area, so less continental area prone to being weathered, which is a cooling process, and also more epiiric uh, seas, which are sea water on continental uh, lithosphere, which is usually shallow because the continental lithosphere cannot go deep. It's floating on the, on the mountain. And these shallow seas, they tend to, um, I see that as they tend to accumulate water, accumulate heat. So when you have a lot of epiiric platform and, and continental seas, uh, your global climate can be warmer. Um, maybe you have more oceanic surface as well. So that's kind of a, that's the contrary of the albedo. I mean, that's the contrary of uh, uh, ice caps, which are white and reflect temperature. The ocean absorbs temperature. Okay, so these, these uh, large scale variations are mainly due to, uh, maybe you heard Wilson cycles. Uh, the Wilson cycles are cycles of spreading and continent assembly and spreading apart and assembly. So there is something there to, to look at. I, I, I'm not sure we have the exact answer. Also, there is a relationship with sea level, but as you can see, uh, the relationship is, is not exactly clear, except we reach some sort of, of low here when it's also very cold in the end of the Carboniferous. Uh, and we are low now also, overall. So it seems to work, but here we have a high sea level according to sea level reconstructions, despite there is a quite a glaciation. Uh, so it's not maybe a one-to-one -one, uh, correlation. Okay, um, these are trends. So they are long-term tendencies. Now, maybe I want to jump to, the, to this one before I go to this one. This one here is a diagram of the last 800,000 years. And on this diagram, uh, which I took from one of the IPCC uh, report or papers, um, which is written by Valérie Masson Delmotte, who is a, a famous uh, climate scientist, French. Um, what, I, what I took from a diagram, which was more uh, exhaustive, is a compilation of data on those last 800,000 years. Data on sea level here, zero is today. 
Okay, today we consider we are at zero. And so you can see what where sea level was compared to now, 100 kilo years ago, 200 kilo years ago, etc. Here in green, we have Bentic, um, I believe Bentic Delta O18, going positive five, uh, if I'm not wrong in the unit, and 3.5 here. So you remember when it's when it's a high value in the water or in the in the calcitic uh, shell kind of shell of forums, it's when you go to uh, colder periods. And this is the temperature here, Antarctic, not temperature, sorry, the delta temperature with today. So it's the difference in temperature from from that point in time with today. So for instance, 15,000 years ago, somewhere here, or 10,000 years ago, or 12, I don't know exactly, we had um, a benthic delta O18 of uh, minus 5, minus uh, 4.5, sorry, 5 or 4.5 positive in the ocean, so very heavy. And this was a time of glaciation. So there was much more ice on Earth at that time. This is the time, uh, if you know a little bit, um, maybe you know that, the, but for instance, the, the Cosquer cave close to Marseille in the south of France. Um, it's, a, it's a cave. I'm not sure exactly the age, but it's a cave which is during one of those last glacial ages. And it's a cave that was discovered uh, relatively recently by divers. So the, these guys were diving in the Mediterranean and they found uh, a tunnel and they followed it. And at some point they arrived into a, a very beautiful cave that uh, was never found before because the only way to enter was by passing, by, by diving through a tunnel completely filled with water. And why is it filled with water today, this tunnel? It's because the, the, the water level today is much higher today than it was before. Okay, so the entrance of the cave has been inundated by the sea level rise that has taken place since the last uh, glacial ages. Okay, so it's quite, a, I find it quite a fantastic story to imagine that this is a place where people were going in and out like we go today in and out in some places in Marseille. Yeah? And um, now it's below water because sea level has risen. So, and what they discovered inside is drawings. And drawings of what? Drawings of penguins, uh, you know, very heavy uh, animals with wool deers and uh, etc. Maybe I'm, I'm wrong about uh, mammoths and things like this, but uh, you know, kind of a, a, a fauna of species of cold uh, times. Whereas if you go now in Marseille, you won't see penguins. Okay, so, so in those times, people who were living there, they, uh, they, they were having barbecue uh, and watching the sea but they were barbecuing probably penguins uh, or, or deer, and they were actually quite cold, not having uh, pasties probably. So the time, the, 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 the climate has clearly changed a lot, okay? And it has warmed up a lot. Um, and as you can see, this kind of warming here, with deglaciation has taken place repeatedly over the last 800,000 years in a very, very regular manner. Okay, look at, and, and, and things are correlated. Temperature, benthic O18 and sea level. Okay, so when temperature rises, sea level rises. When temperature drops, sea level drops. And the Delta O18 changes as well, which means that oxygen is trapped in ice. So this is the melting and warming uh, of ice 
so melting and freezing of, of ice caps in the pole regularly that is responsible for these oscillations. And here, what uh, Masson Delmotte and colleagues have put is the Milankovic cycles that Betim was speaking about before. And there is uh, several parameters. One is precession, one is obliquity, and one is eccentricity. You remember that these are these, these parameters, precession, obliquity, and eccentricity, are geometric parameters of the uh, orbit of the Earth around the Sun, but also of the way uh, the axis of the Earth is oriented. Okay, the axis of the of the Earth as an angle. This is the obliquity, and it changes. This angle is changing with time, and it changes regularly with a period of forty thousand years. Okay, and this has an influence because in the summer or in the winter. So let's say you have an angle like this, very steep. Then summer and winter. I mean, this this is influencing the exposition, the exposure of the North Hemisphere and the South Hemisphere with respect to sun, the heat and the insulation given by the sun. When you have an, a high angle like this, for instance, then your Northern Hemisphere will receive much less insulation than the Southern Hemisphere. Okay, and when then the angle is again is, is, is like this, then it's going to be the contrary. So these kind of parameters they influence how the planet receives heat from uh, radiation from the, from the sun, okay? And how it changes during the year between summer and winter, okay? Often, actually, I think often these parameters are represented in terms of how much insulation the Earth receives at 65 degrees of latitude in the northern hemisphere. Okay, and so it changes with obliquity, it changes with eccentricity, which is the shape of the ellipse, and it changes with precession. Uh, precession, so the angle of the obliquity is how much is the angle, and precession is the orientation of the angle. So for one angle, of obliquity for, for, for a single obliquity, you can be like this, the axis of the earth can be like this, but then it, it can be oriented like this, or like this, or like this, okay, with respect to the to the to the whole configuration. And so this is 20,000 years, this is 40, and this is about a hundred. And we can see clearly that these astronomic parameters from the, the Serbian uh, astronomer Milankovic. First, they can be calculated accurately, and also they can be calculated back in time very precisely. And we see that they have a clear expression in the Earth's climate. Okay, so we have the 100,000 years cycle here. We have the 40,000 years maybe here and the 20,000 years at a higher resolution. So all these, all these things, they combine with each other and they don't always express themselves in the same way, but they are there, they are present. Some people think about it a bit like in an orchestra. In an orchestra, you have several instruments. One of them is the triangle, for instance, you know, this little uh, triangle and you, you go ding, 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 and you can give a rhythm with this. Then there can be uh, other percussions and each of them has its own beat rhythm, okay? So these are rhythms given by the astronomic uh, cycles. So we are going to stop and we'll start again this afternoon, but what we have seen is long-term trends which are set if you think uh, about an orchestra there is some sort of melody here given by plate tectonics and here there is a beat a rhythm 
set by the astronomical configuration. Okay. Um, so, so, so all of these exist at the same time. So on this melody here, if you zoom in, we can zoom in. We, the zoom that I show you here is here, but if we would zoom in here, we would also see something similar to that. Okay, this beat is always there. And so this afternoon we'll speak about that in the Seno 